Great. Thank you, Sam. Thank you so much for the invitation for Sarah Cannon um, and our, our team to um, present today and be part of this event. Um, on behalf of our Sarah Cannon clinical team, joining from across the country for tonight's program, we'd like to thank the Amit Melanoma Foundation for this opportunity to present to all of you and to engage in a discussion about melanoma. Um, the AIM and Melanoma Foundation has been vitally important for advancing patient advocacy, patient education, and melanoma research since 2004. So we're excited for our patients, our community, joining together with the AIM and Melanoma um, Foundation for tonight's event. So our uh, first speaker, um, First, I would like to welcome Dr. Gerald Falchuk. Uh, Dr. Falchuk is a medical oncologist and director of drug development at Sarah Cannon Research Institute at Health One in Denver, Colorado. Uh, Dr. Falchuk is an internationally known expert in phase one drug development, spanning his career at both MD Anderson Cancer Center and Sarah Cannon Research Institute. One fun fact, um, Dr. Falchuk has been instrumental in the development of BRAF targeted therapy for patients with melanoma dating back to his work over 10 years ago. We're excited to have him join us tonight to discuss cl clinical trials. Please help me welcome Dr. Gerald Falchuk. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. McCain. And thank you for having me here uh, together for this uh, wonderful session. Give me one moment here so I can share my screen and, and uh, show my slides. Um, hopefully I'll get this, get this uh, done correctly. Okay, is that projecting all right? Looks yes. great. Wonderful. Um, again, thank you for having me here. As, as you heard, I'm a medical oncologist in Denver where I lead Sarah Cannon's Denver Clinical Trials Unit. I spend a lot of time talking with patients about clinical trials and I see patterns of what most patients know and don't know about clinical trials. So I've structured this presentation to cover the things that I think most patients are wondering about and thinking about when they come to meet with my clinic for the first time. Um, so the scope of the challenge in cancer research is that a lot of people get cancer in this country, about 1.6 million people each year but very few patients actually enroll onto clinical trials. It's less than 5% of patients, probably less than 3% of patients. And there are a lot of reasons why. There are all kinds of barriers. For some patients, it's distance to travel to a center that has a clinical trial. And some patients simply are not even aware of the potential benefit of clinical trials and why they might want to enroll. The National Conference of Cancer Network, which creates the guidelines for cancer patients for, uh, for this country, uh, has on every single page of their guidelines that the best care of any cancer patient is in a clinical trial. And uh, this, is, this is really the mantra that we live by. And, and uh, I think this is what uh, improves outcomes in, in the long term. So what is a clinical trial? Well, for any new drug to get approved by the FDA, it goes through this very big process to determine if that new treatment is both safe and effective. There are different kinds of clinical trials. You may have heard about these, phase one, phase two, and phase three. So in a phase one trial, we determine what the side effects are of a new drug, what the right dose should be. And most importantly, we get an, an idea, an early idea of which types of cancer the drug might be the most promising for. In a phase two trial, we learn how effective the new drug might be for a specific type of cancer by seeing how many patients a tumor shrink and how long until a tumor grows. Phase three trials are probably what most people think about when they first hear about clinical trials. These are large randomized trials in which about half the patients get a standard treatment, half get a new treatment, then we see which treatment did better. This is kind of a busy slide. Uh, there's a lot going on here, but there are a few things I wanna point out. We call this the drug development timeline. So in this green box that I've just put up on the screen, it, gives an idea of how many drugs have to get evaluated to get to even just one that's good enough to get approved by the FDA to help people. So for every 10,000 new drugs that we study in the lab, on average, only one in a thousand, only 10 out of that 10,000 will be good enough to move into clinical trials in people. And out of those 10 trial, out of those 10 drugs that enter clinical trials in people, on average, only one, one out of 10 is good enough to get approved by the FDA. Uh, because it's, it's effective. The next thing I want to point out, though, is how long all this takes. So I have different columns here. The left column is what happens in the lab. The middle column is 
uh, what happens in clinical trials. And the last column is, is the FDA. So drugs spend a lot of time in the lab before they even make it to clinical trials of people. Uh, years and years on discovering what, what marker or what pathway uh, to understand the science better to figure out a better way to fight against cancer. Uh, so years and years in the lab to even identify um, drugs that, that could be effective. Once a new drug enters clinical trials of people, on average, a drug may spend a year in a phase one trial, two years in a phase two trial, three years in a phase three trial. Uh, even if that phase three trial shows there's benefit, the FDA will take on average at least a year to review all that data. Uh, so that means at the end of that time, it's more than seven years from the, from the time the very first human was treated with a new drug until FDA approval is more than seven years. And I, I probably don't need to tell this audience that cancer patients don't have seven years to wait for new drugs to get approved. And this is why patients come and seek out clinical trial options because of the possibility that a patient may get access to a new promising drug years before it's approved by the FDA. I mentioned earlier that a lot of work happens in the lab and that often means work with mice. And this is not a picture of regular mice. These are chocolate mice. If you look closely, you'll see that the head of this mouse is a Hershey's Kiss the ears are slivers of almond and the body and tail is a chocolate covered cherry. Um, one of my patients brought in a tray of these. She made them. She made a whole tray of these at home um, to bring to our nurses just to do something nice. She wanted to uh, have them uh, feel appreciated and she brought in a whole tray of it. I, I couldn't believe it. I've never seen anything like this. I took a photo and I promised her, I will find a way to incorporate these into a presentation. So there you are. Um, so because of all this work that we do in the lab, our understanding of cancer complexity has increased dramatically over the last 20 years. This is a slide about lung cancer. I know this is a, a melanoma group, but I think lung cancer is a pretty good example of, of how far we've come. 20 years ago, when we talked about lung adenocarcinoma, we were talking about one type of cancer. That's how we thought about it. That's how we treated it. That's how we talked about it. How was it? Lung cancer, lung adenocarcinoma. Today, when we talk about lung adenocarcinoma, we're not talking about one disease, we're talking about dozens of diseases. There's EGFR lung cancer, KRAS mutated lung cancer, BRF mutated, HER2 amplified, RET, ROS, MET, ALK, it's a whole alphabet of these different subsets. Uh, and each of these different types of lung cancer, we, uh, they behave differently, we treat them differently, and we design clinical trials for them differently. This is true not just for lung cancer, this is true for every type of cancer. In melanoma, we have a really great example about these BRF mutations that I think many in this audience knows about. Um, and it's really a, a new world of how we, think about, uh, how we think about cancer and how we treat it. Um, so this is what we call molecular profile testing uh, using a technology called next generation sequencing. It used to be a very long time ago, it took forever to, uh, to figure out uh, what mutations and genetic abnormalities were present. Uh, even 10 years ago, when we did one of these panels, and I ordered, when I ordered one of these panels, it was an eight gene panel. And we thought that was amazing. You could order a panel to figure out what mutations were present and then decide what treatment a patient should get. Eight genes, we thought it was great. Today, when I order a gene panel, it's more than 300 genes. They do it with with a fraction of the tissue that we had that we could do it on 10 years ago. We do it, they do it a lot faster besides. Um, in the future, I, I say future lightly because really it's today. Now that, that gene test is, is a blood test, what we call a liquid biopsy. There are fragments of tumor DNA that are in the bloodstream. This blood test can capture those fragments of DNA and, and test them for different mutations. Um, this kind of technology is pretty exciting and doesn't always find something useful, but it does find what, what I would call an actionable target about 30% of the time. And that can really make all the diff difference in terms of which treatment, what kind of treatment we might recommend for that patient. Um, and this is a pretty good example of how that kind of testing and identifying these kinds of mutations can, uh, can completely uh, change how we treat uh, patients. So um, Dr. McKean mentioned earlier BRF mutations. I was very fortunate to be 
involved in the development of uh, the first BRAF inhibitor. Uh, BRF mutations are pretty common in melanoma. It's about 50 to 60% of patients with metastatic melanoma. And uh, when the first BRF inhibitor came along in a phase one clinical trial, um, I enrolled a lot of patients. And we were able to get that drug approved uh, for melanoma back in 2013. There's another drug, a, a, a class of drug called MEK inhibitors uh, that also target that BRF pathway. The first MEK inhibitor, uh, trametinib, was approved also in 2013. It didn't take us long before we were combining drugs. We found that this combination together was more effective than one by itself. Uh, we got that combination approved in 2014. And why were these drugs approved and, and, and so quickly? So this slide is a graph. Uh, it's a bar graph or what we call a waterfall plot from that first in human phase one trial. On this graph, each bar represents one patient. And the, the bars you can see mostly go down uh, to the negative numbers. Those negative numbers are how much of a decrease we saw in the size of the patient's cancer. So you can see most patients, the vast majority of patients, their tumors got smaller. Pretty remarkable result for an early uh, phase one clinical trial. Um, but this is what happens when we find uh, a mutation that's uh, very, uh, that seems to drive the cancer to grow. We have a new drug that will, uh, will block that pathway. And graphs are nice, but each one of these bars in this graph uh, represents one patient who has a story. And I'd like to share a story of one of these patients. So this is an image from a PET CT of one of my patients who enrolled in that first in human phase one trial of DEVRAF. If you don't look at PET scan images very often, I can tell you that the things that show up dark are things that are metabolically active and they're usually cancer. You can see on one side of this image, there's something very large in uh, the chest and shoulder of this patient, and that's, that's tumor. This patient's tumor is involving the, the shoulder and the chest wall. Uh, you can imagine this was a, a very painful tumor, uh, made it difficult for him to move his arm, um, but we found that he had a BRAF mutation, and he got referred for this clinical trial. Um, this next image is his PET scan just two weeks later. We were getting image we're getting repeat scans just two weeks of the treatment, day 15, and you can already see he had a dramatic response, what I would call a metabolic response. He certainly still had tumor there, but it was smaller, it was less painful, he had more movement of his, of his arm, uh, a, a really nice result. And this is really not, not the only patient on this clinical trial that had a dramatic result. And these kinds of stories uh, led to uh, the approval of this drug. Uh, I think everyone in this audience probably also knows that melanoma commonly spreads the brain. And unfortunately, most of our drugs don't get into the brain very well. Usually we have to give, give radiation uh, to the brain or do surgery to remove tumors that have gone to the brain. And something remarkable uh, we observed with this new drug, dabrathinib, we found it was effective against tumors that spread to the brain. Um, these images show uh, on the very far left, multiple small tumors in the brain. Uh, then at week six, they're getting smaller. And at week 10, completely gone. Uh, again, many patients uh, with this kind of uh, result. And it really was a paradigm shift for how we think about treating melanoma and how we think about targeted drugs and what, what they can do. So you might be wondering, well, this is all very interesting and exciting but am I eligible for a clinical trial? How do I find that out? And how does it all work? Um, well, most trials have lots of different eligibility criteria. On average, I'd say at least 50 or 60 different eligibility criteria. And the first thing that we want to know is whether the patient is feeling well or not feeling well. Is that patient in a wheelchair or does the patient spend most of the time in bed? To be eligible for clinical trials, patients have to be feeling well. It's not that we expect the treatment is going to be very toxic. It's that often when we start a trial, we don't know. And from a safety standpoint and from an ethics standpoint, the FDA insists that patients who enroll in clinical trials are feeling well enough that in case, in case they do encounter bad side effects, that at least they have some, some reserve, some buffer. Um, most of the criteria also have to do with things like organ function. So things like liver function, kidney function, blood counts, cardiac function, and sometimes the type of cancer. 
many patients are eligible for clinical trials, and any, any patient who's interested should have a discussion with their treating oncologist. What are the other barriers? So um, there is a waiting time after prior treatment. We don't want any interaction from the previous treatment uh, with the new clinical trial treatment. So most clinical trials require waiting three or four weeks after the patient has finished their last treatment. There's also the potential for an interaction with a regular medication. So uh, we take a look at all of the regular medications a patient is taking. And if there's any, any potential for an interaction, we'd have to either stop or replace that regular medication and replace it with something else. The other barrier is how long it takes us to start the treatment. Unlike a standard treatment or standard of care chemotherapy, uh, where a patient's oncologist can tell them on a Monday, we're going to start your treatment tomorrow on Tuesday, when it's a clinical trial, we usually can't start that quickly. It's more like two weeks, sometimes longer, before we can start. Why is it that it takes so long anyway? Um, so I should say out loud, if it hasn't been said or thought of already, is that these treatments and clinical trials are still considered experimental. And so everything with clinical trials is regulated by the government, as it should be. But that extra oversight uh, does mean extra processes that take more time. Uh, there's also scientific considerations that go into these. And so um, I bring this up early with patients to give them an expectation of how long it takes until we can start treatment when it's a clinical trial. Um, the next question is, who pays for these clinical trials? How does, how does that work? Will, will insurance cover it? Short answer is yes, but patients ask me this question all the time. Um, uh, the truth is that uh, now, these days, insurance companies are required by law to cover clinical trial treatments. How does this work exactly? Well, this began with a Medicare rule in the year 2000 and was later followed by laws passed in individual states and eventually the Affordable Care Act, which is federal law, in 2014. Basically, everything that's done in clinical trials, it goes into one of two categories. There are research costs, and then there are standard of care costs. Research costs are things that are paid for by the trial itself. So example, uh, no one can, can uh, charge money for a drug that's still considered investigational. They have to get that for free. Or if the trial has a research biopsy, the trial pays for that. Those are some examples of research costs. The other example is standard of care costs. These are things that are considered standard when a patient's getting standard treatments, things like their doctor visits, routine labs, routine scans. <clears throat> when a patient gets these things on a standard treatment, it gets billed to the insurance, which then covers it according to the patient's policy. Now, when a patient gets these things done as part of a clinical trial, those items are still considered standard of care. They're still covered by insurance the same way. So patient's copay stays the same, the deductible stays the same, the max amount of pocket expense, all those things stay the same when a patient's on a clinical trial. So I think at any, any presentation these days about cancer research uh, has to include a discussion about cancer immunotherapy. I think probably everyone in this audience has heard about immunotherapy by now. Uh, you know it's important when it makes the cover of Time Magazine. And I'm going to spend a couple minutes talking, talking about it. I usually will draw a picture for my patients in clinic. And the picture goes something like this. This is a cancer cell with the nucleus and the DNA located inside. And the outside of that uh, cell, that cancer cell, has various receptors. <clears throat> what happens is a signal comes in. A signal comes in and... It sends a series of signals that eventually gets the nucleus and tell the nucleus to make more cancer cells. That's the 10 second explanation of what happens in cancer. And our job is to do something to prevent that from happening. The older drugs, chemotherapies, they, they attack the DNA directly in the nucleus. And that can be a good way to kill cancer cells, except that it also causes damage to lots of normal cells. So we spent a lot of time learning more about those other receptors and signals uh, to find a smarter, safer way to treat cancer. Well, when I talk about the immune system, I like to use a military analogy. There's this immune cell called a dendritic cell. And a dendritic cell is not a soldier, exactly. It's more like a scout. Its job is to go take a look and find something that shouldn't be there, like a cancer cell. Then this scout cell will go tell the rest of the troops. And in the immune system army, the troops are these immune cells called T cells. 
once the immune system knows what it's looking for, it'll generate millions and millions of T cells that are designed to seek and destroy. That's what the immune system is supposed to do. And that's what happens when we get an infection, bacteria, a virus, when they get vaccinations. That's what our immune system is designed to do. But when we get cancer, it doesn't work so well. It's like the immune system can't even see the cancer is there and the immune system can't attack what it can't see. So how does immunotherapy work? To explain this, I'm gonna zoom in on one cancer cell and I'll zoom in on one T cell. And I mentioned receptors. So if we zoom in on one receptor on a cancer cell, one receptor on a T cell, you can imagine how they interact or communicate or talk. You can imagine there is a conversation happening between a cancer cell and a T cell. That conversation might sound like this. The cancer cell says to, his t says to the T cell, you're in the wrong place. Everything here is just fine. You should go somewhere else. And the T cell, well, the T cell is really gullible. T cell says, oh, I'm so sorry. I'm in the wrong place. I'm going to go somewhere else. If you're a fan of the movie Star Wars, the expression is, these are not the drones you're looking for. The cancer cell plays this Jedi mind trick on the T cell so the T cell can't see it. And so a cancer cell can do whatever it wants. To take this analogy a little bit farther, probably too far, the cancer cell is the Death Star and the T cell is the X-wing fighter, but I digress. Um, what, we didn't always know this was happening. We didn't know about this interaction between the receptors on cancer cells and the receptors on immune cells and T cells. Once we learned this is what was going on, our next thought was, well, what if we could block that? If we could block that, then the cancer cell couldn't tell the T cell to go away. And instead, the T cell would stay and attack the cancer the way it's designed to do. And this is the idea behind modern immunotherapy. People that discover these interactions, they got the Nobel Prize several years ago. Uh, all this because of the work uh, that happens in the lab and the work with clinical trials to find better treatments for cancer. Um, this is my last slide, uh, but there, I think these are the last big questions that many people in the audience may be, may be having, um, wondering about. Uh, the first question is, are clinical trials promising and what advances are being made anyway? Well, this is an exciting time to be in cancer research. Every year, the FDA approves more than 30 different new treatments for cancer. And because of these new treatments, patients are living longer and more people are being cured from their cancer. These breakthroughs would not have been possible without many years of research in the lab to discover and design new treatments against cancer, not to mention the many patients who enroll in clinical trials to show that these treatments are safe and effective. Another question I get is, what are the side effects on clinical trials? Well, I think that everyone understands that all drugs have possible side effects. In general, the newer treatments today have less severe side effects than what we were developing 20 years ago. We know more about cancer biology and that usually translates into less severe side effects. It doesn't mean that we never see side effects. I see side effects all the time, but I think not as severe as what we used to see. And lastly, how do patients with cancer find out more about clinical trials? Well, I will say that there are many different types of clinical trials and the information that patients may find on the internet can be overwhelming. The best person that patients should ask first is their oncologist who can give advice on whether a clinical trial would be right for them and where to start looking for clinical trial options. So I hope that this was a helpful presentation and that clinical trials now feel <clears throat> less mysterious and more accessible. Thank you for having me here today. Great, thank you so much, Dr. Felchuk. I think that was a really helpful presentation for what can be a very confusing topic to a lot of patients. So that was fantastic, thank you.